Welcome. I'm Margaret Ansflan, the Executive Director of the Climate Markets and Investment Association, a nonprofit trade association aiming to lead a global coalition of private sector actors um, looking to mobilize the trillions needed in order to enable a transition to a climate resilient, low carbon, sustainable economy. Um, before I introduce our opening speaker, we've got a few points on the format of our event. Uh, first of all, we're live streaming this discussion with panelists here with us, uh, as well as uh, calling in from the Netherlands. Uh, the audience is also a mix of in-person uh, attendees and those joining online. Um, if you've joined us online before and have questions for the panelists, please submit these to the WhatsApp number uh, you will see on this video live stream. Feed. We'll also try to feed these questions through during the Q, uh, question and answer session, along with any questions from audience members that uh, they might have. This session is being recorded, uh, with the recording being made available after the event. Many thanks to the Dutch Embassy and to the Dutch Center for organizing this really timely event. We have great speakers with us here today. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to the Dutch Ambassador, Carol van Oostrom, to start us off. Mr. Ambassador, over to you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for those kind words and for that introduction. And a warm welcome to those of us here uh, live and those who are looking at us on their screen. Uh, at this Green Finance event with us focus how to implement and to achieve Paris alignment. Um, and first and foremost, thank you also to the panel members who will be joining us. Uh, this is an event by us as a Dutch embassy to the UK, so we're very proud to have both speakers from the United Kingdom and from the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And my opening words, I've structured them along three C's, along the three C model. First, COP26. Secondly, the wider context. And thirdly, some conversation topics for our conversation this afternoon. So maybe first on COP26, the beginning of this month, I spent two weeks in Glasgow uh, with all my uh, ministers. And some highlights uh, I would like to share with you. Um, it was not as ambitious as we hoped, um, but it was much better than we feared. So now we see that over 80% of the world economy is commit committed to achieve minus 50% greenhouse gas reductions by 2030 and net zero in 2050. That's an enormous step forward. Secondly, we agreed on a mechanism to make the right calculations and a mechanism to monitor. Uh, we had agreement on financing, uh, helping finance the, the challenges for the poorest countries in the world, the least developed countries. And we made an agreement on where to invest uh, adaptation funds, and certainly for a low-lying country like the Kingdom of the Netherlands, but certainly also the United Kingdom. These are challenges on a daily basis. Um, but with these commitments in place, as my Prime Minister said, we only need three things, implementation, implementation, and implementation. And to have implementation of everything we committed to, we cannot do that as a government alone. We need civic society and organizations like you, like yours, but certainly also we need the private sector. That brings me to my second point, the wider context, the context in which we're operating. Just a few elements. In the financial sector, we're talking a lot about uh, environmental, social and corporate governance, the ESG program, which from a government perspective directly connects to Agenda 2030 and to the Sustainable Development Goals. Second element, certainly in the context of our discussion today between UK and Dutch experts, experts is of course Brexit. At the moment we still have almost full regulatory alignment between the EU and the UK. At the moment we don't have uh, equivalence from the EU, uh, but one of the key challenges in the coming period will be on the one hand to keep profiting as we do today from each other's experience and knowledges and the other to, to not have a situation of complete divergence in the regulatory environment we're working in. And the third element, of course, is COVID. Uh, this event, of course, is partly online because of COVID rules. Um, and of course, I don't have to explain all of you experts what the uh, financing by our central banks and the fiscal policies of our government means at the moment for the uh, uh, wider financial situation and certainly not the fear some of us have for inflationary pressures. But that context is relevant because that brings me to my third point, the conversation issues for this afternoon. When we talked in Glasgow, I spoke to the Ingrid Thijssen, the, uh, uh, let's say the Dutch director of the British CBI, 
um, and I talked to a mayor. Um, and they all were concerned about a number of issues. And certainly there were so many banks and financial services also present in a pavilion in the COP26 event place in, uh, in Glasgow. So first and mo foremost, the discussion was about investing, divesting, about speaking up in uh, shareholder meetings, about uh, positively and proactively engaging with your clients when it comes to new portfolios. How do you make your portfolio sustainable? There's a case for profit. There's so much money going to be spent in the whole sustainable field. On the other, there was an enormous fear also in Glasgow, and I hope this afternoon we can address it as well. The fear of stranded assets, from, where from one day um, uh, 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 profitable assets turns into a liability. So this tectonic shift, as, as BlackRock has called it, uh, faces us all, and I really look forward to hear your views. Third item, of course, is um, uh, the, the role for government and the interaction between the private sector and government. How do we make sure that the regulatory environment promotes sustainability, promotes a green future? And my last more personal point is Dutch Ambassador to the UK. How do we make sure that the EU and UK will remain aligned? And certainly how can we as Dutch and British people, as North Sea neighbors, we are so close across the North Sea, how can we continue to profit from each other? I really wish, uh, look forward to a very fruitful uh, conversation. I've talked to you about results of COP26. I've talked to you about the wider context, and I hope the conversation topics I gave to you will provide a basis for a wonderful conversation this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. We really appreciate your words, and very timely, uh, this discussion, because the financial sector really does play a key role uh, on the road to a greener world. Um, and so we're delighted actually to have our, our, our keynote speaker here today, Ingrid Holmes, who's the executive director of the Green Finance Institute, to, to share with us um, her vision at the Green Finance Institute. She'll explain a bit about what it is, but really it is intersection between government and the private sector. So over to you, Ingrid. Thank you. So Mr. Ambassador, distinguished guests in person and online, thank you for the invitation to address you today on the topic of Paris alignment in banking. Before we dive into our technical discussion which will follow and is the subject of today's meeting, I wanted to spend some time first reflecting on the why question and in particular the significance of the COP meeting which of course the Ambassador has mentioned but which are new to many in the finance world, because I think it's a really important framing for our discussion that will follow. While climate change has been acknowledged as an issue important enough to merit annual meetings of global government representatives for more than a quarter of a century, it's not an issue that impacts all countries equally. Here in the UK, we are and will continue to be relatively well sheltered from the effects of rising global temperatures. I say relatively, as you don't need me to remind you of the concerns about increasingly frequent flooding, heat waves and rising sea levels across the UK. In the Netherlands, as the ambassador mentioned, the lowest lying EU country, there are also major concerns about sea level rising and flooding, which is prompting formal cooperation now between the UK and the Netherlands on adaptation and resilience. But this is minor compared to threats facing other parts of the world. While we talk about average global temperature increases, this negates the fact that parts of the world are and will continue to be more affected than others. Already we're seeing an increase in desertification in parts of Africa and Asia, unseasonal wildfires in parts of the globe ordinarily associated with snow and ice, and of course low-lying islands threatened with extinction if sea level rises are allowed to continue at their current rate. And of course, it is these more vulnerable countries, often in the global south, that have the fewest financial resources to deal with these threats, without the option to build seawalls or reinforce infrastructure to be resilient and to increasingly more frequent and intense storms, cyclones and hurricanes. That is why COP is important. It's an annual opportunity for the poorest nations and those most affected by and least able to cope with the effects of the changing climate to hold richer nations to account for the loss and damage caused. And because greenhouse gases cause damage beyond their borders from which they're emitted, to use this as an impetus to drive global agreement on how first to bend the emissions curve 
onto a downward trajectory and then eliminating emissions by 2050 at the latest. This is what global climate scientists have told us needs to be done and importantly have said can still be achieved. But only if we move now and with speed, courage and conviction. These are quite emotive words to use in a speech about green finance, but I think they're needed. Delivering 1.5 degrees as a maximum global temperature increase will require structural changes across the global economy, not just in how we source energy, but in transport, buildings, manufacturing, land use and agriculture. Success requires, as the ambassador said, halving our global emissions over the next decade and moving from a model based on extraction from nature to replenishment and restoration of nature, from competition to collaboration. We need a new mindset. We need it because the goal of keeping global temperature increases to no more than 1.5 degrees is hanging by a thread. Global governments have pledged targets and policy initiatives in their nationally determined contributions that while an improvement on Paris still amount to 2.4 degrees, far beyond what is safe. While the agreement at COP26 for governments to come back next year with strength and pledges offers hope, so too did the pledges made by coalitions of the willing at Glasgow on forestry, methane and finance. Experts from Carbon Tracker and the IEA estimate these further pledges, if made good, put 1.5 degrees within striking distance at somewhere between 1.8 and 1.9 degrees Celsius. These pledges, of course, include the 130 trillion GFANS initiative, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, headed up by Mark Carney, which includes 95 banks, 66 trillion in assets under management that are committed to aligning their lending and investment portfolios with net zero emissions by 2050. That's phenomenal. It changes the nature of the discourse around forging stronger climate pledges ahead of COP27 by making them seem more politically possible to achieve with these systemically important institutions on board. But the banks must now step up to seize the opportunity and use this momentum not only to foster conversation and calls for stronger government action, but to deliver action themselves. But the path ahead is foggy. Committing to Paris alignment is, let me be clear, a leap of faith. We're in an experimental phase, facing challenges in how data is collected and targets set, how choices are made over which tools and methodologies are used to assess alignment, and questions on how to report and communicate effective progress made on the ground. But I think that's okay. I think the fact is activity is happening, spurred on both by a conviction changes needed within the industry, but also a growing sense of urgency from the financial regulators that radical changes are needed in the way that climate risk is identified and managed within banks, but also other financial institutions. My sense is that the current approach being taken by regulators is the right one allowing innovation and trial and error in learning how to integrate and manage risk effectively, including the role of scenario analysis, which is not at all straightforward. Yes, there are issues with patchy data and black box methodologies that can stand in the way of understanding individual client-related climate risk meaningfully. Internal systems are not set up to look at risk over the timescales climate change related scenario analysis implies. And this is compounded by uncertainty over how markets in different jurisdictions may respond to the climate challenge, given the mismatch between what some policymakers are saying and what the science says is needing to be done. And there's a lack of consensus on how to turn climate metrics where they do exist into appropriate climate related financial disclosures. It's for this reason enlightened regulators such as the PRA and indeed the FCA, the asset management regulator in the UK, is taking a very consultative and constructive approach with industry through exercises such as the Climate Financial Risk Forum, which is convened by regulators but led by industry, and is exploring how best to implement scenario analysis, risk management and undertake disclosures. In effect, industry is helping write its own rules for disclosure against the TCFD framework, which will be entering into UK law soon. Through that approach, organisations involved are sharing learnings as they go along, 
which is, at the right, which is the right way to go at a time when we need to innovate. We need a thousand flowers to bloom. A similar approach has been taken with the biennial exploratory scenarios, helping firms to also, but also the regulator, the PRA in this case, to understand and better manage climate related risks and how to supervise those risks, providing more detailed guidance on what scenarios to use and which financial metrics are likely to be most useful in thinking about how business models need to change. When regulators do step in finally, I expect it will be at a point where consensus is starting to emerge around best practice from this period of testing and innovation. It's that kind of radical collaboration we'll need to see more of over this critical decade. The other kind of radical collaboration I'd like to mention before I close my remarks is with clients. Because at the end of the day, that is how banks will become net zero through the kind of client activities that they finance. Engaging with clients will be key to success. Many banks have already been doing this. It's one of the key drivers of the green bond market, now estimated to have over two trillion in cumulative issuances. But the more difficult conversations now need to start on supporting clients' transitions to fully sustainable business models, including making green opportunities happen through helping create new markets in green industry, sustainable transport, agriculture, resilient buildings and infrastructure, and the desisting of activities that a 1.5 degree carbon budget and a physically changing climate cannot tolerate. Transition finance will be key, so too will exclusions. Some of these conversations will be hard conversations, but they will be critical to success, and I welcome the engagement of banks in the challenge discussions progressive institutional investors, such as the Climate Action 100 initiative, have long been engaged with on financing coal and tar sands and the need to phase that out, as well as a shift to clean economy activities. On the latter, greater public policy engagement will also be critical. We know there's often a gap between aspiration and delivery of government clean economy objectives that will also mean, if addressed successfully, significant new green finance opportunities. It's the gap that the Green Finance Institute was set up to address, and we're now running coalitions of public and private sector organisations, including banks, looking at financing building retrofit, transport decarbonisation, and nature restoration, to name a few areas. We no need more banks at the table, working through the issues of fair ways and means to allocate risk and opportunity across the public and private sectors, and connect global capital to the local solutions, be they north or south, that will make or break our ability to keep global temperature increases to no more than 1.5 degrees. One of the things that can be so debilitating in the face of climate change is its enormity and the systemic nature of the changes that need to happen. But it does need to happen and we all need to play our parts, however big or small. It all matters, it all makes a difference. That's why we all need now to make active decisions to help drive whatever change is needed using whatever powers and influence we have to do so. That means not waiting for perfect solutions before we act, but facing and embracing the uncertainty, learning by doing and sharing what we learn as we go along in what is, ladies and gentlemen, the fight of our lives. Thank you so much, Ingrid, for that um, opening keynote speech. And it really sets the tone for this because today we're, we're going to do a deep dive into Paris alignment and banking. We're going to look at what the methods and the challenges are. Um, we've got a, a stellar panel, some of these virtual, some of these in person, which is great. Um, and I do, I'll introduce the speakers just briefly, and then we'll, we'll get started. So we've got uh, Andre Abadi, uh, who's the Managing Director, the Center for Carbon Transition at J.P. Morgan Chase. We've also got Armand Ferreria, uh, who's Director for Sustainable Finance at ING Group. Uh, we've also got Chaired uh, uh, Krumpelman, Global Head of Advisory, Reporting, and Engagement, Group Sustainability at ABN AMRO. Um, we are joined here by Supriya uh, Sobti, who's uh, TCFD Implementation Lead at NatWest Group. And we're also joined by Gil Lindhorst, Executive Director at Partnerships for Carbon Accounting Financials, 
or what's referred to as PCAF. So I'd like to get started, and I'd actually like to start with um, Gil uh, talking about PCAF to set to, to, for, for people to understand exactly what that is. Uh, Gil, PCAF is a partnership of financial institutions that work together to develop and implement a harmonized approach to assess and disclose the greenhouse gas emissions associated with our loans and investments. Um, it's become a standard in the market. Can you briefly share more about PCAF and, and how PCAF connects with other initiatives towards Paris alignment? Yeah, thanks. And uh, really honored to speak at this event and be part of this uh, panel. Happy to explain uh, more about uh, this open source uh, collaboration of financial institutions. Uh, and uh, it, it covers banks, asset managers, asset owners, insurance companies, all financial institutions are welcome to join this uh, collaboration and currently uh, we have 177 financial institutions with over 55 trillions in us dollars in assets among the group and we are rapidly uh, growing in all areas of, of the world to connect financial institutions with each other to drive uh, the measurement of uh, emissions related to their portfolio in order to uh, get them on their journey towards uh, net zero, because this is a key step uh, for them. I also brought uh, a, a few slides with me to show how PCAF connects to all the initiatives uh, that are out there, because I think that will help also to show that connection and also show that this landscape of uh, methods and tools is rapidly growing. And it's good, I think, to understand where all these type of initiatives fit into uh, the net zero journey. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. Um, just some brief words on, uh, on PCAF, as I said, 177 financial institutions. It started in the Netherlands as a mix of financial institutions, then went to North America and now global, in September 2019, we launched a global initiative funded by philanthropies. And it's also free for financial institutions to, to join. It's fully funded by philanthropies. And uh, we collaborate to indeed help financial institutions to measure and disclose emissions associated to their financial activities. It's led by uh, these eight financial institutions that form the steering committee and we were really pleased that uh, building on the work done by the, the group in the Netherlands and the North American group, we were able to already publish the first ever standard on greenhouse gas accounting and reporting last year. So last November, we already published the standard, which was also approved by the greenhouse gas protocol for measuring emissions related to a uh, financial portfolio. And that standard is now out, is being implemented by all these financial institutions. And actually we continued with this, the work to also expand on the standard to cover new uh, asset classes that are not covered in the standard uh, to have also uh, methodologies available for financial institutions to measure emissions related, for instance, to their sovereign bonds portfolio or green bonds, or also emission removal. So we have also added now uh, new methods uh, that are under public consultation at, at the moment. The group is rapidly growing and uh, we expect that uh, next year we will have 250 financial institutions globally. Uh, and um, yeah, and afterwards we'll, we'll continue. What's I think also uh, unique is that uh, because we had a lot of uptake also in uh, the UK, the UK network is managed by Federated Hermes, we also decided to group uh, 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 the PCAF UK members into a separate uh, group. So they are currently collaborating at the national level to also drive uh, the implementation and uh, NetWest is part of that. And we'll probably also speak about uh, their efforts in the PCAF UK uh, context. So just uh, some quick words on how this connects to other initiatives out there. Uh, uh, PCAF developed together with the World Bank, with the Finance Coalition of Finance Ministers, but also with uh, the UN uh, Financial Center for Sustainability, a strategic framework for Paris alignment. And you will see that on the next slide, if you could move to the next slide. 
This is a publication uh, that was uh, requested by a lot of our uh, our members because the, the there was a growing landscape of initiatives out there focused on climate and that uh, we're building on each other and we wanted to guide uh, the signatories to PCAF on where these all these initiatives come in into their journey towards net zero and what type of methodologies and tools they provide so we made a global map and we done this uh, twice now the first publication was in december 2019 and this was early this year in uh, april this year we published uh, this document showing how 19 global open climate initiatives for financial institutions can help on the way to net zero in the next slide you see uh, a key graphic from this uh, this publication that shows the interactive steps that uh, we defined based on all uh, all types of initiatives out there and a lot of research was done to clearly define which steps are needed on the journey to Paris alignment and to net zero so uh, we see that it of course starts with the measurement and disclosure financial institutions have to understand what's in my portfolio and what are the emissions that are related to the loans and investments that I have in my balance sheet. When you have that baseline inventory of emissions, you can do a scenario analysis to come to a target. So you can apply the various scenarios that are out there to understand the overall transition for your mortgage book, for your real estate portfolio, for the business loans that you have to heavy emitting sectors. And based on that scenario analysis, you can define uh, targets. Also scenario analysis also feeds into the strategy development to in order to engage with uh, clients and to develop transition plans, you could say, connecting to taking uh, real actions. So we had uh, this uh, framework set up with clear definition on each of the steps in order to make it clear uh, what steps financial institutions need to take. And we mapped these initiatives, that's the next slide, these 19 initiatives that are out there, that are open for financial institutions to join, we mapped them onto that uh, framework on, well, measuring, setting targets, doing scenario analysis, setting up and developing the strategy, taking action and disclosure. So you see here, the 19 initiatives that we mapped and actually over the past uh, months a new initiative also uh, came and were launched so uh, we will definitely update this but this picture is still uh, valid uh, to a large extent and there you see that also pcaf plays a key role in the measurement of emissions but there are other initiatives out there that will also be highlighted uh, in this event like uh, the science-based targets initiative that uh, helps financial institutions to set targets like uh, the pacta tool that uh, was applied by ing to also perform a scenario analysis and to align with the paris agreement but in the end also to take action and i'm very uh, very uh, clear uh, pleased to see more and more also initiatives out there that focus on helping financial institutions uh, to take action so with this, uh, I, I like to hand over back to, to you because I think this, this gives a good overview also for uh, the further uh, discussions we have with the panel. Great, thank you so much, Gil, for um, giving an overview of the PCAF standard that you developed. And, and you mentioned about um, ING and the PACTA, um, PACTA for banks. And so actually I'd like to move to Armand. Uh, Armand, uh, ING employs a Terra approach which makes use of various methodologies, and, and you helped develop this uh, Pacta for Banks, which was co-created along with the Two Degrees Investing Initiative. Could you provide a brief overview of uh, ING's Terra approach and Pacta for Banks? Because I, I know this is a, a different route than, um, pa than uh, um, uh, PCAF. PCAF. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. And, uh, 
Indeed, uh, at ING, we, we started actually already 25 years ago with focusing on our footprint on um, uh, what's now called ESG. So uh, at first looking internally at our own footprint, our own uh, scope one and two emissions, etc. And along the way, we actually realized that an impact for a bank like ING and the other peers also is much larger if we can help our clients to become more sustainable, especially the lending clients, which we can influence uh, what, what, what the money will be spent on. Uh, so along the way, somewhere between 2015, after the Paris Agreement in 2017, we developed what we called internally the Terra approach. And indeed, this has developed uh, into what's now called the, uh, the PECTA uh, methodology. Actually, like Giel just said, um, you have actually two main standards for, uh, for the measurement. One is uh, looking at the absolute emissions, so the financed emissions of, a, of a, a bank, for instance. So then you can track the progress on a portfolio level and pinpoint where specifically in the portfolio uh, something needs to uh, be, um, some actions need to be taken. And you have the second methodology, and that looks at actually the measurement of emission intensity. And uh, that's also the basis for what ING does on a sector specific target setting. So we look at the different sectors that we finance. Of course, the, we first looked at the ones with a higher uh, footprint. And we started calculating per sector the intensity so that we know which sectors are worst off and which actions we would need to take in the in the near future. So the first one, um, PCAF focuses a bit more on the absolute measurement on a portfolio level. And the other one, the intensity uh, looks more at, uh, at the sector-based approach, but actually both methodologies are complementary to each other. Um, and at ING, we have what we call a toolbox approach. So depending on the purpose of the measurement, we can use one or the other uh, methodology. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And it's, a, it's, it's great how you're able to um, compare and contrast and, and that, that you're talking about this complementarity. Um, and I'd like to move in and, and, and bring Andre into the situation because JP Morgan has developed a, a tool called um, Carbon Compass, a methodology that guides uh, the bank's approach for Paris aligned target setting. Can you share with us briefly the journey and rationale of what went into the development of Carbon Compass, Andre? Sure, happy to, and, and <clears throat> good to be part of the conversation. Um, I think just picking up on a couple of, of points from, from two previous colleagues, when, when we were considering how to look at Paris alignment um, within our, our sector or within, within the sectors that, that we have exposure to, we also wanted to capture not only our lending but our capital markets activity because as an investment bank, you know, I, I think when we actually started looking in detail at, at the sectors that are most carbon intensive, you know, as much as 50% of our activity is capital markets. And, and so we, we thought that it made sense for us to come up with a methodology that captured not only our lending um, to the sectors, but also, as I said, the capital markets underwriting. And the approach we've taken is actually uh, quite revolutionary or different from what I've seen in, in the market, because we're actually taking 100% of the capital markets activity that we underwrite. Um, because we, we recognize that that is, is you know, full value of the activity of, of us supporting the sectors that are most carbon intensive. And so what we decided to do was, was first of all, focus on, on three sectors, certainly within the U.S. economy that had the largest footprint. Um, so that was oil and gas, the power sector and the automotive sector. We, we also wanted to focus on those three sectors because they did represent a large exposure to us, both from a lending and a capital markets activity perspective. Um, but also they were at different points within the overall carbon value chain. So you had the upstream oil and gas extraction, you had the, the downstream use of, of oil and gas in, in power generation and in automotive as well. And we, we also wanted to make sure that methodologically we captured the emissions that were most relevant within each of those sectors. And so what that meant for, for the oil and gas sector is all three scopes, scopes one, two, and three. But even there, what we decided to do was, was depart from some of the methodologies we've seen, which, which aggregate into a life cycle emissions approach, because we actually recognize that 
The strategies companies would employ in the oil and gas sector when it came to operating emissions, so their scope one and two emissions, would be somewhat different from how they would address or tackle scope three emissions, so the downstream use of products. So we actually have two separate targets within our methodology. The power sector, I think, is a little bit easier. You look at scope one, you look at the emissions from electricity generation. And then for the automotive sector, again, Typically, people will look at scope three, which is the emissions from driving a vehicle. But again, we felt as if that didn't appropriately capture what was a fairly large footprint from the, the manufacturing of automotives. So we added scopes one and two. Plus, a lot of the, the automotive methodologies out there do not include light trucks in the US. And as, as, as we know in the US, a lot of people drive light trucks as passenger vehicles. And so we also adjusted our methodology to make sure we, we included that. So we came up with an approach that, that certainly made most sense for the type of business we were doing, both from the financial product perspective, but also the sectors that, that initially mattered most. Of course, this is just the first step. These are three sectors. We've joined the Net Zero Banking Alliance. Um, and, and like most other banks, we are now planning the, the additional sectors that we're going to have to tackle and the methodology and, and scenarios that we're going to be tracking towards and what benchmarks and targets we start setting. Thank you so much, Andre. Uh, really interesting to hear about these three different methodologies. Um, and for those joining in online, don't forget you can um, uh, submit your questions via WhatsApp. The number is there on, um, on the video. But, but let's turn to Chair, because we've heard about the PCAF. We've heard about um, the PCAF standard. Uh, ING's uh, Pacta for Banks and JP Morgan's Carbon Compass, um, but AB and AMRO actually uses PCAF. So from, from a practical perspective, can you, you know, when did you start with PCAF and, and, and how do you apply this? Over yes, um, well, good afternoon everybody. Great, great to be here and to be part of this uh, interesting conversation. So, so AB and AMRO is one of the original founders of PCAF back in 2015. So. Uh, it's it's kind of our duty to also use it in our disclosures and our reporting and the way that we steer uh, the bank. So already I think when the first um, uh, standard, even before it was approved by the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, uh, when, when we developed the first standard just in the Netherlands with a few banks, we already started using it to measure and report some of our carbon impacts. And for us as a, as a Dutch-based uh, bank, the biggest part of our balance sheet is in, in mortgages, actually, and in, um, in corporate loans and in investments through our private bank. So those three asset classes were really important to us to get a carbon measurement and a carbon methodology uh, that we could use to, to disclose the, 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 the absolute carbon emissions uh, for those three parts of our activities. So for the first time, I think we disclosed in 2016, the part of our mortgage portfolio, then in 2017, we added our corporate loans and the investments that we do for our clients in our private bank. Now, since then, we've evolved, the standards have evolved. Uh, we've invited many other banks to join us on the journey uh, of carbon accounting. And um, uh, we, we've also embedded on other um, standards and methodologies that help us um, get in line with Paris goals, well below two degree, 1.5 and net zero. Um, because that's where the financial sector as a whole, including AB and AMO needs to go, and we need to help our clients in that direction. So we've also in included it into our strategy, into our group strategy as a bank, to say we want to support our clients transition towards sustainability and carbon accounting um, and carbon accounting methodologies uh, truly help us to get our balance sheet in line with those goals. Uh, and, and since then, we've also invited larger corporate clients um, uh, and uh, been in contact with many financial institutions to invite them to join uh, uh, both PCAF and other initiatives and to collaborate with us and share our experience um, going forward and seeing how we can, together, we can improve and align on this methodology because one aspect has not been mentioned so much uh, in this conversation, but comparability is key here. So that's why we're, we're developing these standards so that stakeholders like investors, but also NGOs, clients can, can compare um, uh, banks based on the, on the same methodology and on the same 
um, uh, accounting standards. And, um, and, and, and so that's why it's extremely valuable to co-create this uh, and, um, and adhere to it um, uh, 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 as we are all doing. And as Gil mentioned in his introduction, it's amazing to see that just in a few years, we now have over 170 banks uh, signing up for this uh, carbon accounting methodology, which is great. Really interesting to hear about your journey and the fact that you were co-founding. So let's turn to Supriya, because Supriya NatWest became the first major UK bank to sign up for, for PCAF in July 2020. Um, and so this is still a relatively new journey for you with the standard. And Hill mentioned that there's even a UK PCAF subsection or, or working group, uh, so to speak. Now, could you share with us how you're incorporating PCAF into your already ongoing um, climate transition work? Yeah, happy to. Um, so yeah, we joined PCAF uh, in February in last year, 2020, uh, which follows on from us announcing our climate strategy in February 2020, which included our ambition to halve the climate impact of our financing activity by 2030. Um, and recently, we've obviously signed up to the Net Zero Banking Alliance as well. Um, so when we started to measure emissions, PCAF standard was obviously um, still draft, uh, but that was a methodology we started to work with. Um, similar to ABN AMRO, most of our balance sheet is mortgages and other corporate lending. Um, so we selected um, the high kind of mixture of carbon intensive sectors like oil and gas, um, automotive manufacturing, agriculture, uh, but obviously to get the coverage across the balance sheet, also residential mortgages, um, and use the PCAF methodology to calculate both emissions um, and then similar to ING, calculated emissions intensity as well. Um, and that has really helped us in understanding our carbon footprint in terms of our lending and book and investment book. Um, and that helps us to plan kind of strategies in terms of how we want to then help our customers transition. Um, the other thing in the PCAF standard that probably hasn't been spoken about so far is the data quality metric. So we are all aware that there are various challenges. So when we published our disclosures last year, we covered in quite a lot of detail the methodology that we followed, um, the assumptions, et cetera, we had to make, um, and also uh, what the data quality scores for each of these sectors and asset classes we covered were, because that's quite important, because this is still a developing area within the UK, um, and for our readers to give them a fuller picture in terms of how this is developing, to make sure our disclosures are quite clear in, in that sense. Um, so the PCAF standard also has um, certain recommendations with regard to disclosures, uh, which we followed as well. Um, so this has really helped us take the first steps in terms of scope three emissions calculation. Um, and this year we are working beyond the four sectors that we published last year um, and enhancing the capabilities across the balance sheet, because this is literally the first step before we start the transition journey, right? So we want to get through it quite quickly uh, and move to the next step. Great, thank you so much, Shapira. Um, so let's let's turn back to Heal because based on the input from the various speakers, I, I'd like to come back to you because PCAF is not only doing work with banks, you're, you're also working on building a standard for insurers. Um, however, with the pledges and announcements of, of so many corporate net zero targets, other sectors need this type of guidance as well. So what, what trends do you see in the market happening with regards to net zero targets and, and other initiatives that we should be aware of uh, designed to either converge or consolidate these methodologies? Over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I see a, a great momentum in the market, in the financial sector globally for harmonization. I think uh, that was clearly uh, also uh, needed eh? a lot of financial institutions and other stakeholders uh, are in uh, great need for well, for more harmonization for convergence into uh, standards and and on a very high level of course uh, there are there were multiple uh, sustainability reporting standard standards and it's really great to see that under the ifrs there's now this international sustainability standards boards being set up to harmonize uh, sustainability reporting globally, and that's a, that's a great uh, great movement, I think, to indeed from from four separate type of reporting uh, frameworks move into one global sustainability reporting framework. Of course, that framework is 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 broad; it covers all types of sustainability uh, topics, 
and all all types of uh, areas like governance like uh, risk uh, strategy etc metrics but it's uh, it's really needed that uh, there's a uh, well, more harmonization on that uh, top level what i see also happening is that on the, the target setting frameworks there's more and more harmonization a lot of the net zero initiatives under the gfans are also of, of course also convened by un and they also collaborate under the gfans uh, network under the gfans umbrella and i think the, the coming uh, years there will be more and more harmonization on the target setting frameworks to be used and that's also uh, linking to your initial remarks margaret Ann, is that uh, we currently collaborate with the insurance sector uh with the net zero insurance alliance to develop also an insured emissions greenhouse gas accounting approach so that the insurance sector can also measure emissions related to their insurance underwriting and apply target setting frameworks to that and they are heavily also looking at the current target setting frameworks that are already out there and are being applied by the asset management arm so I see that there is more and more harmonization also on target setting. And lastly, I, I think also that there will be a big movement on harmonization on data. And that's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, and there are uh, some big initiatives on open source uh, data, uh, where also there should be uh, clearly data, uh, well, definitions and rules and, also, uh, platforms like XBRL can help out to standardize data flows into an automated way that you, from machine to machine, can get data from corporate reporting into the system of financial institutions uh, automatically on an, well on a regular basis to do the reporting and to do steering. So I think uh, a lot of work is to to be done, but I see great momentum in this harmonization space. Thank you um, very much for that. Uh, this, this movement towards um, standardization and a lot of these, not just initiatives, but this work is new. And so it's you know, groundbreaking at one time. But let's, let's actually then go to Chaired because Chaired, you inferred that PCAF was, was really kind of a starting point on a bank's uh, journey. And, and given what's been discussed so far on the panel, what's, what's next for AB and AMRO? Because PCAF, as you mentioned, really was a starting point, but you guys are, are moving further and further. So can you share with us what's, what's next on, on your horizon? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to do so. And, and it is indeed a starting point, and it is a way of measuring and reporting. And Gil is right, and the others on the panel are right as well. We need better data, and we need, uh, we need more structured data, and et cetera. But, but actually, to quote both the ambassador and our prime minister, what is needed now is implementation, and, and, and that's what a lot of banks, including ABN AMRO and the other banks on the panel as well, what we are doing already for a couple of years. So engaging with our clients, trying to see how we can help them uh, reduce their emissions, how we can improve the sustainability of the homes that we finance, how we can help our corporate clients um, make their business models more sustainable, how we can uh, transfer uh, traditional investments to more sustainable investments in our private banking operations, um, and also, and, and this, is, this is important to mention, I think, also leading this by example ourselves. So our, our own offices and our own, our own actions, they are less impactful on, on a total scale, but they do give us credibility and they do give us best practices that we can share with our clients that own real estate or property as well. So, so now that we have a certain standard for accounting, for accounting carbon, um, and we agree on this standard. Of course, the standard always needs further development and needs better data. We're working on that, but it's also a time uh, not to wait for things to become perfect. It's a time for action now and for, implement, for implementing these carbon reduction methodologies and for making sure that we meet the global goals and, and, the, um, and, and the scenarios that have been set up for that. So really engaging with our clients helping them reduce their emissions. I think that is a task uh, that a lot of banks, including ABN Armour, are working hard on uh, on a daily basis. And we have been for many years, and we will uh, continue to do that in the years to come. 
Thank you uh, so much, Chair. Um, I, this notion of implementation, the private sector is never going to argue with you about that because private sector is all about action uh, and, and getting things done. And in fact, really, when you think about it, when you consider this 1.5 degree scenarios or net zero trajectory, the private sector in its own way um, perhaps even has you know, a much larger role to play in, um, in implementing the goals of Paris. So let's actually then turn to Ingrid, because at, at GFI, you work closely with the UK government um, and other governments, but, but what do you make of, of this from a, a regu regular to regulator's viewpoint? Because while standardization and consistency is important, it's apparent that there are benefits of different methodologies and having more tailor-made solutions for each subsector in the financial industry could help speed things along. And, implement things quicker. Um, but we know that the, you mentioned the, the Prudential regula um, Regulation Authority is working on standardized approaches, yet the uh, NGFS has designed a set of hypothetical climate scenarios which, uh, and will look to add further sectorial granularity. So, you know, what's the balance here? Um, really good question, Margaret Ann. Um, thank you. So, um, I mean, I think the reason the regulator is stepping in with some of these centralized scenario is because this stuff's hard. Um, in my last role, we spent some time with climate scientists at Exeter looking at how we could take their climate models and scenario analysis, which I think is how this was originally envisaged, and plug it into our macroeconomic models. And it just wouldn't work, not least because our macroeconomic models only went out something like 500 days. So that's just not a long enough time frame. So while I think there is some fantastic progress happening, particularly in bigger firms in thinking about building own scenario analysis models, it became clear that some help was going to be needed for the industry to get them started, and in particular taking lots of these different off-the-shelf um, purchased or free at point of access um, approaches to scenario analysis and trying to turn them into something, some numbers that insurers and, and uh, banks could plug into their uh, risk models as they stood. And I think that's the right way to go. The risk there of providing scenarios that everyone then follows is it provides what I call a false comfort that we've got this covered. So, because these are scenarios, right? This is for a future that we don't quite know what it will look like. There's a lot of uncertainty. So back to the points I made in my, my opening remarks, I think we are in a phase where we want a lot of innovation, people looking at approaching this in different ways because then we don't end up with a situation of compounded risk because everyone's looking at it in the same but wrong way. Um, and I think the other point I'd make at, the, at this, this point around innovation in the development of these kinds of tools is um, disclosure around the disclosures is going to be the way to go. So as um, Supriya said, um, sort of setting out for readers some of the limitations around some of the methodologies used so it's completely transparent what we know, what we don't know is going to be key, particularly given a lot of the off-the-shelf um, products are actually underpinned by IEA scenarios, which we know are now out of date and need updating for the new 1.5 degree number. So lots of uncertainty and I think sort of full transparency at this point in time is useful. That's a really good point about the transparency and I like your point about disclosure, around disclosure. Um, so let's move to Andre because uh, banks are already uh, climate stress testing and considering material financial risk uh, using various scenarios. And as the ambassador mentioned in his opening words, you know, divestment is happening. However, there is a difference um, between the scenarios being used for stress testing purposes and a bit like what Ingrid's point was versus what scenarios banks are invest investigating to use strategically to make better decisions at a client or sector level. Can you share with us the work um, you're conducting on this, some of the findings, how you're using these to make better strategic decisions, and your thoughts on this, um, this issue of divestment? I'll, I'll, I'll leave the divestment to, to the end. I think the, the, it's, it's a really interesting space because I, I, would, I would say that if you go back probably five years when, when Mark Carney was, was very much the, the only regulator talking about climate risk and the tragedy of the horizons, um, a lot of the initial thinking within banks was from a risk management perspective, from, from a second line of defense perspective. And 
I think that's important to note because if, if you look now at, at the work that the PRA has done, um, the ECB, of course, is following suit with its own stress test requirements as of next year. And, and we're seeing conversations in the US now, globally, Brazil, South Africa, um, a lot of the APAC countries. So, so we're, we're seeing a, a, a spread of requirements and requests coming from a, a range of regulators. And, and I think just going back, Ingrid mentioned the Climate Financial Risk Forum, which JP Morgan has been part of for the last two years, um, facilitated by the, the PRA and the FCA. And in fact, this year, we chaired the, the sub working group around scenario analysis within banking. And what is quite striking is we, we just issued a white paper a couple of weeks ago, I think it's about a month ago now. Um, and in that paper, we basically set out three different use cases. So if you're looking at transition risk, then you may decide on using a certain scenario, which is quote unquote, a stress scenario where you think, you know, let's, let's take our current baseline assumptions of what we think the economy, the global economy is going to, to look like in, in you know, the next decade, but then let's stress that. And what is interesting is a lot of the stress work that banks have been doing is focusing on a one and a half degree uh, tail scenario. So a less likely scenario. Separately, banks are looking at physical risk. And there again, you might take a different scenario. You might use RCP 8.5, which is the most extreme um, physical impacts. But then when it comes to alignment, which is a lot of the conversation we've been having here around um, what AB Namro, ING are doing uh, and others, um, you may then decide on using something like the IEA net zero or the IEA sustainable development scenario. So very much depending on what it is you're solving for within the financial institution, you may decide on, on slightly different scenarios as your starting point. I think what, what is interesting now is that with 95 banks having joined NZBA, and we are going to need to, to start coming out with, with targets in, in the next 18 months to, to 36 months, which will be net zero aligned. You're, you're now starting to see not much daylight between a stress scenario and a strategic scenario, which, and I think it builds on, on a point that Ingrid was making, you know, that there's a broader question here about if all 95 banks that have joined NZBA subscribe to exactly the same scenario, that could lead to systemic risk. And that's something that I'm pretty sure regulators would, would want to be pretty, pretty careful about. Um, and so, you know, this, I think you'd, you'd ask the question, Margaret Ann, about, you know, is there a benefit in, in having a diversity of approach? And I certainly think there is. Um, and certainly each of us has different business models, as I alluded to. For ourselves, we have a large capital markets book. And so, what works for us may be somewhat different from what works for, for other um, institutions. Now, I think there is definitely room for commonality in approach, so there's, there's consistency in reporting, for instance. But in terms of actually what scenarios and what targets you set to manage the risks in your portfolio or to align your strategy, it may be that you see variances. And I think just coming, coming on to your last question about divestment, look, I think that's likely to be an inevitable part of, of the trajectory or the, or the the, the pathways that, that any of us follow. Um, once you start setting targets, as, as we've experienced the last 18 months, you very clearly see which companies and which sectors are unlikely to change their business models quickly enough or at all. And so what you immediately are faced with is, is a conversation around, do we continue to bank or support that client? Now, clearly I think we're, we're all in the business of, of actually trying to finance the transition. And a lot of the companies that may not yet be transitioning May, may be the vehicles we need in order to help facilitate um, the transition. So it is about us as the financial sector working with those clients to try and help them transition. Thanks. Uh, so thank you so much for, for that, for sharing how uh, you are approaching this. And um, it's obvious that it's not one size fits all um, as to a decision as to how you take this forward. Uh, I'd like to move forward on with Armand, actually, and, and, uh, and ask you to share how this type of information uh, is translating into your financial products and, and services. You know, how, how are you connecting this work to your financing in the market, for example, either through green on our social loans or linking it to, to KPIs? Could you share a bit more about this? Because we, we discussed this uh, prior to uh, this session, and I think it would be very beneficial for for the audience to hear about this. Yeah, sure. Um, so indeed, after all this measuring and, and checking which sectors are on the trajectory uh, of our own portfolios, 
we, uh, in the meantime, started working on engaging with our clients, of course. Lately, we hear the discussion in the market of some parties um, pulling away from financing oil and gas. For instance, the uh, big pension funds, uh, fund a uh, ABP, uh, announced that they were stepping out of financing Shell or investing in Shell. Um, that's a very clear message, first of all. On the other hand, we prefer as a bank, uh, ING as a bank, we prefer to engage with these kind of companies, keep engaging with them, not talking about Shell specifically, but uh, in general, so that we can help them and influence them how they can get on the right pathway and how they can uh, reach the targets and also become net zero, at least uh, uh, preferably by 2050. Um, so what's what's happening is that we are having these discussions um, at ING. It's roughly about 700 billion euro, our total lending book. A uh, large part of that, let's say 40% is residential uh, mortgages. Uh, the other 40 to 50% is uh, corporate lending. So in, in diversified corporates and then uh, the specific ones in the, in the sectors. Um, this means that we are engaging with them, talking to them and helping them to be on the right pathway. So we are advising them and where they need more advice, more specific advice, we introduce them to the right uh, parties in the market. Looking at the products, the products that banks have developed uh, in the past few years, new products are, of course, the green loan and the social loan, a bit uh, comparable to the green and the social bond market, so in the capital, uh, debt capital market. Um, that's where we look at the use of the funds that the, that the companies are, uh, are uh, borrowing from us. So we look at the, the, the assets or the project that you're financing. Is that green enough? Yes or no? And nowadays, as you know, we uh, have the EU uh, taxonomy, which we follow and uh, we check if the transaction would be in alignment with the EU taxonomy. Yes or no? If yes, then it would be eligible as a, as a green loan. Um, so that's the way that we try to steer that part of the of the business. And another large part is, of course, all the general corporate facilities that banks uh, lend to uh, to corporates around the world. And that's a bit more difficult because you never know what they're going to use it for exactly. So that's where we developed the uh, what we call the sustainability linked loan or sustainability improvement loan. That's where we link the ambitions and the targets that the company will reach in the coming years to the facility itself. So to the interest that the company needs to pay for the uh, for the facility. If they reach the targets that uh, we as a lender uh, set, then they'll get a discount. If they move in the wrong direction, obviously they would be paying a, uh, a penalty. And this is a very popular product, I have to say. We introduced it in 2017 and uh, it, it really skyrocketed uh, around the globe. So not only in, uh, in Europe. And uh, it's, it's a product that's very positive, uh, positively um, accepted by the companies because they say, we know we need to engage not only on climate, by the way, we also look at the, the S and the G. So also, uh, um, at, 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 at biodiversity, at circular economy, um, at um, how they treat um, their, their suppliers uh, in, the, in the whole value chain. So we look at the full scope and then we, we link it to, uh, to those specific KPIs. And it's, uh, like I said, um, companies like it very much because they really see that whatever the, the steps that they're taking, that they are rewarded, although it's a small reward, uh, it's a few basis points on average, but at least they see it as a reward for the good steps that they're taking in the right direction. Thank you, Aman, for sharing the practical application of, of the work that you guys have been doing. Um, and and I'd, I'd like to turn to Supriya, because one thing missing in this discussion or that we haven't really deep, deep dived into is, is, is the customer. Um, which follows on nicely from what Armand was saying. And, and setting a transition plan is, is one thing, but how do we manage that customer journey as well? And can you share with us what you're, you're doing with your customers to help them reduce emissions as well? Yes, so um, obviously I mentioned we are 
kind of on the journey to measure emissions and we've heard a lot about implementation and taking action. So the good news is that we've, at NatWest we've started to do that already. Um, so as I mentioned, mortgages are a big part of our loan book. Um, so we've got a sector specific approach in terms of how we support customers. Our climate ambition and strategy is very much aligned to helping our customers transition. Um, so we're trying to work with customers across sectors. So if you look at the mortgage sector, we have a product called Green Mortgages, uh, where customers can avail um, a discounted rate mortgage to buy energy efficient homes. Uh, we're also working on educating our customers, both ac across the commercial sector as well as the, the residential sector, so or the, the personal sector. So our NatWest app, if you go to that, you can actually see based on your spend what your carbon footprint is. And we are hoping as customers uh, see this statistic, they start to actually cut their carbon footprint, right? Um, on the commercial side, we have partnered with um, uh, Microsoft um, to again provide uh, carbon tracking tools to our customers so they can become aware of their emissions and hence work to reduce emissions. Um, we last year launched a target of 20 billion of climate and sustainable funding and financing. And initially we'd set it up as a three year target, uh, thinking that's how long it'll take. Uh, but we actually um, surpassed the target in 18 months. <laughs> so we have now set a 100 billion target up to 2025. Um, so while there is a supply, there's obviously also a demand uh, in terms of uh, working towards transition. And we are working with customers across sectors. Um, the other thing we're doing is partnerships. Um, because this is not something we can do on our own, right? This is a partnership across countries, across organizations with the government and other things. So some examples of those partnerships, I mentioned Microsoft already. Um, we have a Green Homes Coalition uh, where we are working with other lenders um, and, and agencies to, to make homes greener. Um, there's the Octopus partnership we have to support the transition to electric vehicles for our customers and making it easier. Um, so there are various aspects that we are trying to touch through our customer journey. And it's not just about um, selling products, et cetera. It's also about the education, supporting the little things that they can change to make the transition to green easier. Um, and that's what we hope helps um, the transition to net zero. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Supriya. So what is interesting about NetWest is not just the commercial side, but also then the customer side. You know, the people like you and me who have bank accounts, um, whereby we can actually uh, take a look at, 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 at uh, carbon footprint, etc. cetera. Um, okay, so we have about 15 minutes left and you're welcome to um, submit any questions on the WhatsApp uh, group uh, chat if you wanted to, but I'd like to dive into one because it's, it's quite interesting. One is um, somebody's written in, I am interested in the panelists' views on the risk of greenwashing. Uh, which uh, we haven't necessarily touched on uh, here. Are these risks mainly reputational or in regulatory environment or let's say credit rating agencies, you know, do th would they view these also as a wider risk? Um, Ingrid or Supriya, would you like to start I it off and then uh, some gentlemen or? I can have a go at that one. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the, there's two major risks around greenwashing. Um, one is that we kill this green finance market before it's even started um, through the reputation risk piece. Um, the other is that we don't deliver investment into the green transition that we need to see. Um, there is another initiative I will just uh, mention that I'm involved in uh, uh, as in my role as executive director of the GFI. I'm also the chair of the UK Green Taxonomy Group advising the UK government on how to implement a, a taxonomy in the UK based on the, the work that's been done in the EU, which is actually speaking to both of these issues. So where do we need to point capital to deliver on Paris alignment and a net zero economy, but also how do we bring rigor to that um, in terms of ensuring that we say, when we say we're doing green products, they are indeed green. I think there are also a lot of great product-based initiatives out there, such as the Green Homes home lending principles and so on, which I think NatWest is part of, um, which also is a, a, an initiative we've led at the GFI, but it's starting to build consensus around what, and agreement around what are the, the, the rigorous processes we need to undertake, but also in terms of outcomes and where products focus, is it really delivering the impact that we need? Okay. Does anybody want to add anything else? Otherwise, I'll 
I'm happy to, just from a user and a kind of disclosure perspective, I think the point you made about disclosure on disclosures probably comes true, right? So I think, that, and there's the point on standardization that, so I think we need more trust in what we are kind of doing as well as disclosing, and that's where transparent disclosures and some standards that, that give us comfort that we're all on the right track, uh, rather than, uh, as Ingrid says, killing the market, because that's probably the downside that right. we may end up with, yeah. Right. Now, before we uh, ask the gentleman, actually, I've just realized um, we've got an actual audience here, and I should have actually opened up the floor uh, to, to the to, Does anybody have any questions here? Great. Could you uh, stand up? Would you say your name, where you're from, and, and yep. either if you want it specifically uh, to a specific um, member of the panel, or, or but, but please in, uh, introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is uh, Anna-Marie Stratov. I'm the Chief Risk Officer with EBRD, a multilateral development bank. Um, I, uh, I had a few questions before we all started, but many have already been answered. So uh, thank you very much for a very interesting, a very diverse conversation so far. Um, one of the things I'm still a little um, puzzled about is great to hear banks are looking at how can we help our customers transition. Um, but one of the things, and, and I think as a multilateral development bank, we think we have a role to play in that transition uh, because we cannot all abandon um, had the wrong technologies. Um, but one of, the, one of the words I haven't heard today is stranded assets. Uh, and um, there's a lot of pressure uh, not to finance fossil fuel anymore and uh, we can all run away from it uh, and, and start to finance all the wind farms. Um, but what are we doing with all the stranded assets? Because uh, there are already examples of stranded assets being bought up by you know, the private sector um, and, and then they basically go underground um, w w as a result of which parties are then exploiting these assets, you know, milking them out. Um, and so for the environment and for the carbon emissions on a net basis, it's a, it's a net loss. Um, and so what is the role um, collectively of the financial services industry in this um, to, to integrate as part of that uh, transition also a controlled transition and, and, and a proper handling of the stranded assets. And it's like the famous um, musical dance, nobody wants to be left without a chair, but I think at the end of the day also nobody wants to be left with the stranded assets on their balance sheet. Um, but how do we do How do we do that? And what is our role? And I, no specific uh, 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 panel member, but possibly somebody from the commercial banks. Thank you. Great, thank you so much uh, for that. And I don't know if um, some of the gentlemen, um, JP Morgan, ABN, uh, Andre, Armand, do you? Our chair. Chair to talk. Sorry, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I guess just a couple of thoughts here. One is um, just on, on the, the stranded assets point, I, I fully endorse and agree with that. I, th I think we, we've seen too often, and, and I think um, BlackRock had said the same thing, that greenwashing can be defined in many different ways, but, but what is happening is, is the, the sale of a lot of fossil fuel assets into you know, private equity and, and, and other parts of the financial system. And so the, that should be part of our overall strategy of engagement with clients is, is actually, you know, ideally you want those clients to retire assets as, as they're managing them. Um, but of course, that's, it depends on the economics, it depends on a number of factors, depends on shareholder interests. So, so I think it is absolutely a, a, an issue we're going to have to, to really grapple with if we're all trying to support a, a transition that also has en environmental outcomes which um, are sustainable, then then I think merely selling the assets to, to someone who's not going to operate them to the same standards is, is not the solution. So so I, I fully endorse that. Thank you. Uh, Chaired or Armand, do you have anything to add be before? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Bit this is also related to a little bit of the dilemma around inclusion versus engagement, right? So, so we have these engagement strategies where we are trying to support our clients in the transition. And at the same time, we feel, we sometimes feel some pressure 
um, by, by other stakeholders to start excluding. And, and we agree that if, if our clients are not moving fast enough in the transition, that it, then they may up being stranded assets and, and being a risk uh, to, the, to the profitability or to the, to the risk return profile of a bank, uh, in our case, ABN Amro. So it is in, our, in all of our interests that we are successful in the engagement strategies, also in more challenging sectors, um, and that we truly help our clients into the right direction to actually prevent uh, the scenario that was mentioned. But, but I am, and, and we are at ABN Amro, a big believer of this more inclusive approach uh, and engaging with clients to move them into the right direction. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Supriya, or we can, we can move on. Thank you, that was a great question though, Anne-Marie, appreciate that. Does anybody else here in the audience have a, a question? Otherwise, we've, we've got a few that are, are coming in online. Okay, I'll move to this. Um, the next question is, what is the place of science-based scenarios in various decarbonation approaches? Uh, this is particularly in the context of whether an emission reduction is good enough when compared to a net zero path or a long-term strategy like the IEA models. Now, I think we, we talked about this, the differences, and perhaps it was Andre that mentioned these, these different approaches that one would take. Um, does anybody have any? So this is, again, what is the, what is the place of science-based scenarios in the various decarbonization approaches? Does anybody have anything to add to what An Andre had um, mentioned, first of all, on that? I can add to that if you want. Great. Okay. Yeah. So uh, what is what is good to to know and uh, is that uh, of course uh, a lot of uh, net zero uh, initiative initiatives have uh, the commitment to align with a 1.5 degrees uh, temperature rise uh, scenario. And if you look at all the scenarios out there, uh, then there are multiple. I think uh, in total 44 1.5 uh, degree scenarios out there at the moment. So uh, building also on uh, the previous uh, speakers is that it's it's important to to look at multiples of these uh, these scenarios because they give additional insights into uh, the transition. So uh, I would definitely recommend that uh, that of course when you want to develop a target for you as a financial institution and when you want to develop a strategy and, and develop a transition plan as the TCFD is currently recommending, then that should build on uh, well a set of scenarios. And uh, as mentioned, there are more than 40 1.5 degree scenarios out there and uh, they have been also assessed and also downscaled by, uh, by the NGFS, for instance, the, the Network on Greening the Financial System has also published uh, scenarios, 1.5 degree scenarios that are downscaled also at country level. So there's already a lot of information out there and I would recommend to use the insights of multiple scenarios to uh, develop targets and to develop a strategy. Great, thank you so much, Hill. Does anybody else have anything to add before we move to, uh, we've got time for one final question before we wrap this up. Okay, let's move on to data because it was very interesting that Heel was talking about lots of information and nobody doubts that there's lots of information available, but um, a, lo a lot of the times you hear there's a lot of data, but not the right data. Um, and I think the question and, uh, and quality of type of data required to align with the Paris Agreement or, or a low carbon trajectory has been raised you know, here several times, um, but, but I'd ask the panel, what do we need precisely to get a, a better image? What would that image look like? And how can we enhance resilience on the data used for setting transition plans and interact more meaningfully with the client? This, yeah, okay. Um, so, I mean, I think we've got to hit this in multiple different directions. I think the announcement that the IFRS will establish an International Sustainability Standards Board is going to help. That's bringing together a lot of these voluntary uh, sustainability reporting frameworks in one place to try to build some uh, consistency around uh, corporate reporting there. We're hitting it through 
um, taxonomies, which will help with particularly green align alignment, opportunity alignment. And I think just remembering that this is a multifaceted set of challenges, and so you're probably going to want to pull together lots of different metrics to express this dynamic process of transition. Again, going back to the Climate Financial Risk Forum, one of the pieces of their latest work um, that I really like is on data and metrics and this idea of a dashboard where different metrics will be useful for different decisions. So as well as your carbon heat map, you need to know where your exposures are in terms of sectors and where you need to start your intensive engagement um, with clients. You need to think about exposure to green opportunities and you need to be thinking about the active process of engagement with clients. So lots of different data sets and also don't forget that through the process of engaging with clients, that's how you're going to extract information to fill your holes. So I think lots going on, lots to be hopeful that we will start to move towards a resolution and towards that all important consistency and comparability across the board. So, Brie, did you, it seemed like you had something maybe to add. Yeah, I think you touched on it on the last point in terms of the client engagement, because obviously we have a dependency on our clients publishing their emission data so that we can calculate our scope three emissions. So I think working with clients, encouraging them to publish. Obviously in the UK, uh, we're now working towards mandatory DCFD disclosures by 2025, so that'll, that'll help us. But I think I'll come back to the point on transparency that data is, will take time to get perfect, but if we can say we are making these decisions, we are choosing these transition pathways, these are, these are the calls we are taking, and this is the underlying data, these are the assumptions, these are the judgments, and being very transparent about it, I think that will help develop that trust and, and kind of confidence in what we are saying, and as an industry where we are moving. Thanks so much. I don't know if any of you gentlemen wanted to add a, a final point to this or, or not, and, and otherwise then I'll, I'll wrap this up. Issue of data. Yeah, maybe next yeah. to tr transparency, which is a very good point, of course, it's also about accountability. I mean, it's easy for companies and, and financial institutions to say, this is our long-term target, we will uh, get there, and, and we will think of the best way to get there. But it's also about accountability on short term, what are you doing, in fact, uh, on an annual base, what's your target for next year, etc. As I said earlier, banks are implementing in, in, in our financing, so uh, companies will need to reach certain annual targets and be accountable for that. If they reach them, they get a discount, otherwise not. But it goes for the whole market, so it's, transparent, it's transparency, but also taking uh, uh, the glove to, to, to uh, be accountable on these things. Thank you, Armand. Any other final thoughts from anybody online? It's hard to read your faces. <laughs> okay, uh, perfect, great. So I'm going to wrap this up and I just wanna thank you, the audience that have come here for the questions as well, Anne-Marie, that was great. And for those online, that have asked questions. It was really interesting questions. Oh, we've had a, a tremendous discussion here, a, a deep dive, um, uh, and we obviously want to, what I've taken away, I've taken notes throughout this. And, and the three key takeaways that I would say would be, one, this need for comparability. And, and that is to say that all parties uh, involved would need to be, be held accountable to take the right steps in decarbonization. And, and this full need for transparency, you know, is required. 2050 is a long way away, 2030 is as well. So, but it's, it's as um, Armand was just saying, it's about those, those short-term steps as well. So this need to compare what we're doing um, and, and what options we have with regards to um, standards and approaches. Uh, the second key takeaway that I, I think came out of here was this client outreach versus divestment. And, and some sectors, We'll just not be able to reach uh, net zero in time. Uh, you know, even we could the application, and we didn't really touch on this uh, about the application of carbon pricing uh, being introduced. But we know that there's the carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, the EU carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is um, you know on the horizon. Um, carbon pricing is uh, you know growing uh, increasingly uh, across uh, various different countries, um, sectors, and and really this one needs to take these, these clients along on this journey was my key takeaway, is this inclusiveness is really key. Um, and then the third point that I would say is really this notion of public-private partnerships or this blended finance, because to get the full economy to net zero carbon emissions, 
We need both the private and public sectors to work together. Governments should provide, you know, if possible, these national incentives. Um, they allow uh, the pub, uh, private sector to, to innovate, but to work with them in, in hand in hand. Um, and so it's been a great discussion. I'd like to thank all of the panelists for your uh, encouragement uh, and your insights. Uh, thank you very much to the ambassador as well for being here, uh, the um, Kingdom of the Netherlands, the embassy here, as well as the Dutch Center. Thank you to all of you and thank you for everyone that uh, is here in attendance and, and joined us online.